and uh, I'm going to start with the uh, with the uh, with the slideshow. Okay, so uh, some background to break down what DNDS means. So in the uh, description of this lesson, I sort of mentioned that we're we'll using we'll be using DNDS to um, sort of test hypotheses about selection. So what does DNDS mean? So to understand that, it's really important to understand this inherent property of the genetic code. And this property is that some nucleotide mutations result in amino acid and changes in the amino acid sequence. And some uh, nucleotide substitutions don't. Okay, so synonymous mutations uh, indicate that, so with synonymous mutations, if you have a synonymous mutations in the nucleotide code, that means that there's really no result, there's no resulting change in the amino acid sequence. So the protein remains exactly the same. So sequence divergence, uh, so synonymous mutations basically is a metric of sequence divergence with no selection because protein remains exactly the same. So on the flip side of that, non-synonymous, um, non-synonymous mutations, I'm having some technical difficulties here. Okay, there we go. So non-synonymous mutations are mutations where a substitutions in the nucleotide sequence results in the change of amino acid. So non so non-synonymous mutations essentially provide a uh, a metric of the conservation of protein sequence uh, in the context of neutral changes, which is estimated by the synonymous mutations. So uh, basically, the more conserved the protein is, the more resistant it will be to, uh, to changes in the amino acid sequence. So if a protein is really conserved, then the rate of non-synonymous mutations uh, should be low. And that's, of course, relative to the rate of synonymous mutations, because all proteins uh, evolve at different rates, depending on, on the protein. OK. All right, so uh, I know Jake was against having these codon tables, but I, I kept one. I made, I made it small though, just to sort of have it as a pictorial. Uh, and so this, this sort of demonstrates the, this property of silent versus non-silent mutations. Is that you could have a change in, an amino, in a nucleotide. For example, you could have a, a U uh, substituted to a C, and then the amino acid that, that it encodes, phenyl, phenylalanine in this case, remains exactly the same. So as you can see, phenylalanine has two permutations of codons that, uh, it, it, uh, that code for it. And there are some amino acids like serine that have a lot more. Right? So serine, there's a lot more flexibility with, there's a lot more synonymous mutations that could occur that where there would be no, if there's an encoder serine, there would be no effect on the, uh, on the amino acid sequence. Okay, so silent or, non -syn or synonymous mutations provide a, this metric of DS, and DS itself is a, a rate of synonymous mutations per a possible synonymous site in a given sequence. <clears throat> and non-silent or non-synonymous mutations, uh, non-synonymous and non-silent, these terms are used interchangeably, so if I go back and forth between one, I apologize. Uh, but this essentially um, provides a metric for DN, and DN is itself also a rate of non-synonymous mutations per all non-synonymous site in a given sequence. Thus, DNDS is uh, a ratio of these two rates, and uh, you can use that to infer conservation or divergence of a particular peptide sequence. So the larger the DS is relative to DN, the smaller the number is going to be. That means there's a lot of uh, neutral divergence that have occurred between the sequences, and if DN remains low, then that sort of that implies strong conservation of protein sequence. And if DN is high relative to DS, then that infers, um, well, I'll, I'll talk about that infers. That could infer a number of things, but uh, it could infer, or it could imply positive selection or neutral evolution. So uh, I put DN DS equals one here as the first example, because DS, as I've mentioned, is uh, a metric of neutral evolution of protein sequence where mutations don't have any effect on amino acid changes. So these are sort of permitted. And if the protein is, uh, if it is not conserved, then and DN, the rate of non-synonymous mutations equals the rate of synonymous mutations, that means that there's neutral selection of the entire sequence. 
So that essentially means that non-synonymous mutations occur at the same rate as synonymous, and that implies little or no conservation of amino acid sequence. So this is sort of pseudogene territory because if uh, a gene is uh, unneeded, not needed by an um, organism like a bacterium, then it's not conserved, and then the whole protein tends to uh, undergo neutral drift at the same rate. So it doesn't really matter if it's a non-synonymous or synonymous mutation, then there's really no constraints on the amino acid sequence. Um, a high DNDS, so a DNDS of greater than one. So if there's more non-synonymous mutations than there are synonymous mutations, that implies that a change in the amino acid sequence uh, is actually favored. So this could be a result of positive selection. So what I mean by positive selection is that if there's changes to a protein sequence that confer some kind of selective advantage, then there is a high likelihood of those changes to be fixed in the population, right? So that's why those are the cases where you would see a higher rate of non-synonymous mutations and synonymous mutations. Uh, if you have a low DNDS of lower than one, then uh, that implies purifying selection. So in other words, substitutions that result in some kind of amino acid change are, are resisted and removed from, from the population over time. So the sequence is essentially uh, purified. So it's a, it's a um, wrap. Uh, by the way, I should mention that if you are uh, one of two learners here and you'd like to ask a question, feel free to um, ask a question in the chat. Uh, I'm not seeing the chat right now, but I'm sure that I'll get notified if there's a question in the chat. Um, okay, so in reality, uh, however, DNDS rarely approaches one, and it, on average, it actually hovers um, around 0.1 or 0.2, uh, and values that are elevated above 0.3 or 0.4, for example, already indicate neutral or positive selection. Uh, I took this, uh, figure from a paper that I really like where they are, uh, they were looking at endosymbiotic bacteria that are evolving inside of, um, I think it's the stink bug. And basically this is an intracellular bacterium and it's a very young endosymbiont. And what I mean by that is that it, it's, um, it has been evolving within the host for a relatively short amount of time. So what we see in that, in that case is that the, what, what you see in, in the symbiosis is the genome tends to get small uh, fairly quickly. But if you catch a genome that's just, that is uh, from a very young end of symbiont, then the genome really hasn't had time to reduce in size, but you already start to see that a lot of the genetic inventory that's encoded by that, by that bacterium is unnecessary and it's starting to undergo uh, neutral evolution. So you start getting a lot of pseudogenes forming within the genome. And that's what this figure is showing is that you see that uh, they sort of drew a line at the NDS of 0.3. So if you imagine that anything here that's orange are uh, genes that are, uh, that are predicted to be evolving neutrally. And then genes that are with the lower DNDS are genes that are fairly conserved. And uh, yeah, so this is this plot's showing DS, DN plotted versus DS. So uh, basically any position on the, on this uh, scatter plot indicates a uh, DN, DS. So anything that's sort of in this quadrant uh, is, has a higher rate of non-synonymous mutations. And then anything that's lower has a lower rate of non-synonymous mutations. So yeah, so this is, uh, and I should note that uh, when I talk about DNDS, I, this sort of implies a pairwise comparison of, of two genomes. Um, so what they've done here is they've taken the um, endosymbiotic genome and they've compared it against a free-living relative, uh, free-living bacteria. And in that case, free-living bacteria aren't really considered to uh, keep pseudogenes around for very long. Uh, but but this one apparently has tons of pseudogenes. Actually, about half of the genetic inventory encoded by this endosymbiotic bacteria is made up of pseudogenes, which is really cool. But the free living relative barely has any pseudogenes, uh, maybe one or two uh, that have been predicted, but that's unclear whether they're actually pseudogenes. 
So yeah. Moving on. Okay. So I think this is a, uh, there, it's also important to be aware of the limitations of using DNDS to uh, evaluate selection or to do comparative genomics. Um, so I put four points here. Uh, so the, this, this idea of non-synonymous and synonymous mutations can only be applied to coding sequences. And by coding sequences, I mean the I mean that the nucleotides are first transcribed into mRNA and then read by ribosome into protein sequence. So this, so synonymity implies dependence of a protein sequence on the nucleotide sequence and can thus not be applied to non-coding sequences like rRNAs, tRNAs, and tmRNAs. So these aren't uh, ever translated into proteins. Uh, so DNDS is not appropriate for comparing these sorts of sequences. Uh, another important limitation is the fact that a sequence, a sequence is diverse through neutral drift and DS increases. Uh, at a certain point, all possible synonymous sites have been acquired, uh, have acquired mutations, and you start getting back mutations, sort of. Uh, you start seeing, you could, you could see that there's a possibility of nucleotide sort of by random chance reverting back to what they were originally. And this could result in artifactually lowering uh, DS. So resulting in an apparently low rate of synonymous divergence that's really not accurate. Um, on the flip side of that, if you're comparing close strain variants, you might see sequences with just a few substitutions. And calculating the NDS values from those can also result in uh, artifactually ero an erroneous number, so in, in, or in apparently elevated the NDS values because DS is so small uh, or so close to zero. So, and, and as we'll see later on in the demo, PAML really doesn't uh, doesn't really do a good job of uh, dealing with those. Uh, masking is another um, limitation. So masking occurs when you have only a small part of the sequence uh, that it's evolving differently from the rest of the sequence. So this can occur in multi-domain proteins or in transmembrane or porin types of proteins where, for example, in the, in the porin or you can have most of the transmembrane hydrophobic regions under very little functional constraint, but the exposed loops are very constrained. So the amino acids that, uh, that are encoded on those loops are very constrained and very conserved and may even be going, undergoing positive selection. So if this is occurring, but you're looking at DNDS globally averaged over the entire sequence, those really short regions that are under strong purifying or positive selection can be, um, can be masked or not seen. Um, Okay, so I think it's time we uh, start talking about PAML. So now that we talked about the limitations, I think it's sort of good to get into this uh, program. And then there's gonna be a short tutorial after this on PAML, actually on just one aspect of PAML. Um, so I, I recently started using this package to uh, do comparative genomics between strain variants. And um, yeah, uh, PAML actually has a lot of really cool things that it does. Uh, including estimating synonymous non synonymous rates and testing hypotheses concerning DNDS. So these first two points that are highlighted is what uh, I'm going to cover in the demo. But it also does a lot of cool things like various amino acid based likelihood analyses, uh, clock models, that's really cool, uh, ancestral sequence reconstruction. So all this cool stuff and it comes with a bunch of programs uh, for all, doing all those things. Uh, I'm still learning a lot about this program. Uh, CodeML, this is what we're going to be going through with the tutorial. Uh, and CodeML is basically like BaseML, so these two programs go, sort of go hand in hand, but CodeML is optimized for amino acids, for protein sequences. Okay, so there are basically two types of files that you can provide to PAML, um, sequence data file and tree file. And I'll talk uh, in a few slides about what a control file is. 
but the, basically you just provide the control file and the control file holds the paths to the tree file and the sequence file that you can provide it. So the sequence file must contain a code on alignment uh, that is an alignment that represents nucleotides arranged in triplets as they code for amino acids. So the code on alignment is what's used as the input to code ML. Uh, and in the tutorial, we'll go over how to make a code on alignment. Uh, but you'll need two files for this. To make a code on alignment, you need a protein alignment and you need another FASTA file with nucleotide sequences, uh, where each nucleotide sequence corresponds to a sequence in the amino acid alignment. So once you have those two files, you can use this uh, Perl script, pal to nl .pl, that comes with the PAML package. And if you give it those two files, the protein alignment and the nucleotide sequences, you can generate a code on alignment. Um, this is what a code in alignment would look like. So this is actually, I recently found out about this program as I, as I, as I was actually researching uh, stuff for this presentation. I've never heard of a DNA tagger, but this is apparently a really cool tool that allows you to visualize a nucleotide alignments uh, arranged in codons. So it's important that the nucleotide sequence is paired with an amino acid file because pal to now back translates the protein sequence and constructs an alignment based on that. So because of the codon degeneracy, it's impossible to un unambiguously predict codons for each amino acid because there could be more than one. Uh, and without some sort of open reading frame as reference or, nu or nucleotide references, regular aligners don't generally align nucleotide, nucleotides into codons. As far as I, as far as I know, uh, there, could, there could be some aligners that are that are optimized for that, but I, I generally use uh, muscle for all my alignment needs, and uh, I use that to do to make the protein alignment, and then I just provide the protein alignment uh, to uh, to palatinal along with the nucleotide sequences, and then it back translates, and then it makes a it makes a, a, a code on alignment. So this sort of shows the the errors that could occur if you just try to align DNA sequence uh, without a uh, protein alignment reference and sort of you lose track of where the codons are and you get weird single nucleotide insertions like this, right? So you wanna provide a protein alignment and then back translate from that. Um, so another possible input into CodeML and one which actually won't, won't be covered in today's demos is a phylogenetic tree. Uh, so these phylogenetic trees are typically provided in NUIC format, uh, and it's provided as NUIC format to this program as well. Uh, so if you provide the uh, sequence file and the phylogenetic tree, that offers a very powerful approach that PAML can make a lot of really cool, run a lot of cool tests with that. Uh, I haven't really perfected that part of the pipeline yet, uh, but I hope to soon, and as I do, I'll, I'll hopefully I'll be able to offer some tutorials on that as well. The, so all of the input, the sequence and or the tree. So the tree is actually optional input. You can just provide code ML with the sequence file. But it, whatever input you're providing, all that needs to be typed out into this code ML dot CTL file, so this is the control file. So this control is a look, this contains the locations of the input and output files as well as, well as the parameters. So there's a lot of parameters here that you can play around with. Uh, there's a really, really long, detailed uh, manual that you can go through that talks at length about what all of these parameters do, how to change them, and uh, yeah. So you can provide uh, absolute paths to your sequence file or your tree file that you're providing, or you can provide relative paths. Uh, and then the code ML script would look for those. If you're providing relative paths to these files, the script will look for these files relative to wherever directory you're running the code ML command from. And then you also have to provide the output file. And this is going to be also written in the current working directory, whatever directory you're in that you're running the script from. Okay, so that's it. Uh, we're gonna move on to the Jupyter Binder tutorial. If there's 